North Idaho College and this evening's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're going to be concluding six weeks of our series on the future of sports. And in this program tonight, we plan on emphasizing two aspects. First, the role of women in sports and what has happened in relation to that, and particularly uh, women in the news media and sports media and how that has affected the sports program. We have a very distinguished guest this evening that is going to be discussing uh, these aspects with our panel. Our guest is NBC uh, sports journalist and commentator Barbara Hunter. Her work includes uh, sports segments on NBC's Grandstand and also the Today program, and special reporting during network coverage of major events. Her first major sports assignment uh, is uh, being a commentator for NBC TV's coverage of the 200,000 Colgate inaugural, the richest tournament in the history of women's tennis. In addition, she will act as the commercial spokesperson for the Today Show. Uh, Ms. Hunter has been a sportscaster for KNBC, uh, the NBC television station in Los Angeles, since joining NBC News in March of 1975. Prior to that, she worked for two and a half years at KGO-TV, the ABC station in San Francisco. A broadcaster for seven years, she began her career in sports reporting at KOAA-TV radio in Colorado Springs, Colorado. There, she was involved in all areas of broadcast production, including children's programming, news, and public affairs. She was appointed sports director for KOAA-TV in 1971. Barbara Hunter, who was born in Fort Worth, Texas, is a graduate of the University of Texas in Arlington. She was a broadcasting major at the Graduate School at the University of Colorado and also taught courses in broadcasting at Colorado and El Paso College. Uh, Barbara, it's a very special privilege to have you here this evening. Thank you. It's a pleasant time to be in Idaho. Everything's beautiful now. We also have with us three panel members to question our guests. First is Janelle Berg, who's been with us for the past three years. She holds a bachelor's degree from the College of Idaho and a master's in counseling and education from the University of Indiana. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you, Tony. Also with us is Bob Singletary, holding a BS degree from Mary State College and an MS from the University of Idaho and is on the faculty in the Department of Music at North Idaho College. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Tony. And third, we have Mr. Jim Upchurch, holding a BA degree from Whitworth College and a Master of Arts in Education and is presently the Director of Financial Aids at North Idaho College. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Tony. We'll proceed to questions in the first series will come from Janelle Bird. It truly is a pleasure to welcome you to North Idaho. Let's start on the optimistic note of the future of women in, in sports. Can you tell us how you predict the future? As to the future of women athletes, I think it's brighter and brighter all the time. I've been involved actively in sports broadcasting and writing since 1969, and it seems that every year brings major innovations for women athletes. Of course, the Title IX program has been a great assistance to college athletes. There are women who are becoming involved in programs that, where heretofore there was little uh, participation by females in the, the college level, in the high school level, and even down to the elementary and junior high school level. The women professional athletes seem to really be getting things together. Women tennis players in particular have uh, made great strides in the past five or six years. They're competing now for generally even prize money in uh, most tournaments with, with the men. And of course they have one great thing going for them. They found that they're also a great gate attraction. And uh, when women have proved themselves to be quality athletes, I think they have found that the rewards <coughs> have been forthcoming. Now, as far as women are concerned in uh, the broadcast media, in sports reporting, I wish I could say that I thought it looked optimistic. I'm not terribly optimistic about it. Uh, one of the things that bothers me most is that it seems that we are looking more and more 
for the former athlete with big name value to come in as a sports reporter, or we're looking for cosmetic value, someone who happens to be very attractive who may have little or no background, either in sports or news or whatever field. Uh, unfortunately, broadcasting stations are playing the ratings game more than ever before. And they're looking for, for people who are attractive to the audience. And in many cases, I'm afraid we sacrifice credibility. <laughs> this question was brought up in one of our earlier shows regarding uh, professional uh, uh, women and professional athletes. Uh, getting into the same win-loss stress syndrome that seems to have occupied men's athletics for such a long time, mm -hmm. and particularly in the college uh, area also, of a uh, tremendous amount of, of energy and money that goes into recruiting and this kind of thing. Do you feel that, that I'd like to get your uh, view on this, do you feel that women's sports are leading towards this? We're going to get into the same pitfalls that men's sports got into? I've seen little of it. Uh, mostly it's the other way around. The women are pursuing the opportunities. There are very few uh, scholarships still that are available to women uh, when we actually compare scholarship opportunities with men. But then again, I think we have to keep in mind the fact that um, in many instances, the only sports at the university level that are paying sports or self-sustaining sports are, for instance, basketball and football. Uh, it's very difficult for me to say, take a scholarship away from the football program to give it to women's gymnastics or women's swimming or women's tennis or whatever, because ultimately the football and basketball programs tend to support themselves. Consequently, there are so few scholarship programs available for women that I think the women are fighting for the scholarship as opposed to the scholarships going out and vying for the athletes. Um, hopefully, uh, within the next five or ten years, we will see uh, women athletes more uh, actively pursued by the universities. But I, I've not seen much evidence of that yet. Jim, I'm sure. Uh, Barbara, you uh, mentioned uh, uh, the area of competency here, and I know that you have your degree in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was just wondering if you would uh, relate to us uh, somewhat, because I'm sure that there's individuals who are uh, in our audience that are interested possibly in, in a broadcasting career. But however, we see on the other hand that uh, quite often that the, uh, the jobs go to the individuals who, for instance, that have been injured, uh, an injured football mm -hmm. player, mm -hmm. uh, becomes quite a TV personality as far as uh, in broadcasting is concerned. I was just wondering if there was anything in the broadcasting field where they're going to be uh, developing competencies for this particular area or? I wish I could be optimistic about that, Jim. It, um, it seems to me, I, I don't know anyone else who majored in broadcasting when they were in school. And I'm certainly an oddity to have gone to graduate school, generally in graduate school for broadcasting. Uh, we find people who are more prone to be academicians uh, and who stay in the university environment. And I think that's a little unfortunate because there are so many things to know that, about our field. One of the things that I find a little frustrating also is that in college and particularly in graduate school, we were taught how to be general managers of stations and how to be uh, program directors and how to be sales directors, but no one really taught us the basic specifics of how to get a job, how to operate a camera, how to edit audio tape, how to shoot film. We never seemed to learn the practical aspects of it, which is why I would suspect so many of us uh, have come from other areas of, uh, of education. It seems that uh, people who are particularly uh, adept at getting into television are people who have been liberal arts majors in school, people who have good backgrounds in dealing with people. Uh, history majors do very well. Political science majors get into uh, news reporting to a, a large extent. PE majors get into sports casting, although it's very difficult uh, in almost all situations. I think it's important to start at a, a small level, to begin at a small television station in a small town, learn your field, know the art, know how to go out and shoot your own film, how to edit it, how to put it on the air, how to edit videotape, and how to do all the work for yourself. Then when you can anticipate getting a, a large city market or getting to a network level, you are aware of what someone else can do for you. I've been in the field and seen reporters ask a cameraman to shoot something that is absolutely impossible for that cameraman to shoot, but they really don't know that, having not experienced it themselves. So I would hope that our broadcasting programs will bring more people into the, into the field, but I don't see it happening right now. Barbara, very recently we interviewed on this program Amy Davis, most recently of the Brady Bunch, <laughs> in relation to her experience, which is of course different than yours. And 
her television uh, work for years, indicated us in rather strong terms that uh, the competition was so severe that it, it might be questionable as to whether or not it was worth it. In fact, she made the comment that she would discourage any young person, man or woman, to enter such a competitive field. Then she went on to say to us later off the air that uh, the fact was that if you could discourage them, then they weren't for the field, is, was her real point. <laughs> uh, is the competition as great within the, either new, uh, regular news broadcasting or sports broadcasting on the national level where you are now? And especially, I wish you would direct your attention to the role of women uh, in making and broadcasting. You are one of the individuals in the forefront for women in national broadcasting. How tough is it? Oh, it is absolutely fierce. It, um Never, never ceases to amaze me that, that things just keep falling into my lap, which is exactly what's happened. Unfortunately, I am not a, a competitive person, and uh, my orientation is to just sit and do my job and hopefully do it as well as I can. And consequently, people have ultimately always come to me and said, hey, we've got this nifty idea. Would you like to do X or Y or Z? And I haven't always been in sports. I, I started in, in broadcasting when I was in high school. My first job back in, in those days, believe me, there were very few women in television. And my first job was doing commercials for a local station in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. And then I worked in uh, children's programs and uh, news and documentaries and have done just about everything, and produced, directed, and whatever. I've found that um, the competition is most fierce in the talent capacity. And what appeals to one general manager or station manager or program director might not appeal to anyone else. As a matter of fact, there's a saying that what is one man's garbage is another man's star. And that's, that's unfortunately the case. It seems that um, there's no way to understand exactly what a producer or a, a manager is looking for. And, and as Anne has no doubt uh, Notice, I mean, obviously she's been in this business for years and far longer than I, and she's such a talented and successful lady that it's interesting to hear her say that because when I was teaching at the University of Colorado, I was always the first person to say, if you have any sense at all, get out of this course, major in something else. Because I find it very frustrating for the kids to come out of college and feel that they're prepared to go to work and then to find that there's no work for them because there are so few jobs. Every television station in the United States has people who are very reluctant to give up their job, and they're trying their hardest to maintain their own status quo, so it's very difficult to break in. That's the toughest part, getting in, you know, you put in the door the first time. Um, as to whether it's more difficult for women, right now I think it's less difficult for women. Uh, the, the greatest thing in the world is to be a woman and be a, another minority as well, because then you've got three shots going for you. But uh, unfortunately, I find that as more women are being employed in broadcasting, we come across a lot of women who are very poorly prepared. And if there's someone who doesn't have the credentials to come into the business, then her poor performance really makes it look bad for everyone else involved. We've seen this happen a couple of times in sports. Uh, a couple of women, particularly on the East Coast, were employed as weekend sportscasters uh, at stations in rather large markets. And the idea was to issue a casting call and say, you don't have to know anything about sports. We'll write it for you. We'll produce it for you. You just come in and sit down and talk. But sports is very difficult when it comes to trying to fool an audience. And you, you can't do it more than a time or two. And because of their lack of credibility, I think it made it tougher for girls who will come later who are perhaps very well prepared because people will turn to a jaundiced eye and say, oh, dear, here we go again. Here's another token. So I, I can see that it, it's looking good and it's looking bad. Thank you. Janelle Burke. What is your particular preparation for sports? We understand your preparation for broadcasting. Are you an athlete also? Oh, I'm a very poor athlete. Uh, matter of fact, I'm a poor tennis player, a poor golfer, a poor racquetball player. I've never done anything particularly well. Uh, when I grew up, I was a great sports fan from the time I was about five. I had a maiden aunt who, bless her heart, took me to all the baseball games. I grew up in Texas. We had no football then. And uh, we went to a baseball game every day during the baseball season. And I didn't know I was a girl. I mean, I knew I was a girl, but I didn't know that I was a tomboy, I guess. But I used to hang my head over the dugout and ask for autographs and play football when all the other little girls were playing with dolls. And then as I uh, got into high school and college, I was more interested in sports, but still as a spectator as opposed to a participant. And um, I was married for a number of years to uh, a man who is um, a teaching tennis pro. And I was uh, an official for the um, Lawn Tennis Association for a few years. Have always been an enthusiastic football fan, baseball, you name it. I've, I've always been involved. 
we used to follow our teams and travel around in the summertime with baseball teams and the whole thing. So I've always been very involved, but not, not as a participant. I'm not a good participant. Do you do a lot of research then? And who does your research? When oh, I do all my own research. And um, I don't really do much because this is uh, nine years now that I've been in sports solely. And even if you just read the wire service every day, it, it's very difficult not to be pretty much up to date on what's going on. Also, the, the wonderful thing about working in sports as opposed to working in news or public affairs is that you deal with the same people, the same teams, the same management year after year after year. So, for instance, a, a little over a year ago, I moved from Los Angeles to New York. Prior to that, I had been in San Francisco and Colorado and Texas. But every time you move, if, if I want to know what's going on in, in Texas, or in California or Colorado or wherever, I know exactly who to call. It's someone that I've had an association with for almost 10 years now. So it's, it's very easy to maintain your research. If there is a, a situation in which I really don't know much about the athlete or the event, and that, that does happen, then obviously I do have to do some homework. But uh, at NBC, we keep uh, a rather large sports library, and I have a rather extensive library of my own. So if there's someone or some event that I don't know well, I can pretty much do my own research. Bob Singletary. You mentioned <clears throat> getting um, a break or getting a foot in the door as being one of the major obstacles and problems. Uh, once that's accomplished, at least a beginning, what do you see as, uh, particularly being a woman, in this area as being uh, other problems and, and obstacles that you have encountered? I wish I could tell you something interesting about that. I haven't encountered any problems. People always say, you know, what's been your biggest problem being a woman sportscaster? What have been your embarrassing moments? What have... I just haven't had anything happen that's, that's interesting to tell about. I found that from the beginning, and, and I think I was fortunate because I started so many years ago, uh, in the beginning, no one said, oh, there's a woman doing sports. They said, oh, there's a woman who knows something about sports. Because again, it's very difficult to fool a sports audience. They, you, you either have the expertise or you don't have it. And I was very well received at the first station where I worked full time as a sports director. And uh, from then on, every time I moved, it was to a larger market, yet your audience finds out very quickly that you've come from another market, or perhaps they've seen something that you've done before. And I really haven't had any difficulties. Uh, working with athletes is uh, a little bit special because they know whether you're trying to snow them in your audience or whether you really did your homework and you know the material. And they will bend over backward to assist you in any way they can. I've never had an athlete who was not absolutely spectacular in his efforts to help. We have never come across anyone who was in any way anything except encouraging. So I really can't tell you about any great problems. <laughs> Thank you. Jim. I was wondering, uh, could you possibly uh, list uh, or give us some of the uh, qualities as you see them uh, uh, that would be necessary for uh, a young woman who would uh, have a sports casting career possibly in mind? Well, I would say first, you really should know uh, the broad, s some broad aspect of broadcasting. It's very difficult. Some people can say, oh, anybody can go in and sit down in front of a camera for five minutes and do a daily sports report. Unfortunately, that's not what's involved. Uh, first of all, uh, you have reams uh, of wire copy and film and, and videotape and whatever. And you have to know what you're looking for. So you have to know sports. You also have to know broadcasting. As you people well know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to sit down and do an hour program, a five-minute program, or even a three-minute sports segment on a, a daily newscast. I would say to have a good, broad-based background in sports. And that doesn't mean you have to know hits, runs, and errors, and averages. People, fortunately, are very little interested in that sort of thing from television sports. The people who want to know all the statistics, look at them in the newspaper because they want to be able to sit and mull over them and digest them over a long period of time. So I think we're more interested in the philosophy of sport and in the idea of the game and the people who are involved with it. So I think it's more important to have a broad-based background, to know enough about broadcasting to feel comfortable when you go in, to, uh, for instance, for your first interview. They'll probably ask you to do an audition. And uh, that, that's pretty nerve-wracking for somebody who's never done it. If you can get experience when you're in college, working on a college station or working part-time for a local radio or TV station, I think it helps because you sort of get a feeling of what it's all about. Or maybe intern if, if there's a program available uh, in a university city or in an area where you're even in high school. If you can intern, go in and watch what happens in a local television station. Um, I think it's good to have uh, as much experience in living 
as you can get because that's the way we really identify with one another is our experiences matched up against the experiences of someone else and there are only a certain amount of times in your life as a sportscaster when you can say you know how's your arm feel and otherwise you're going to have to have some insight as to what makes a human being tick so I, I think to know people to know sports on a broad basis and, and to know broadcasting. I must insert here what Bill Russell said before we go to the next question in relation to what you just said. He said education is simply learning to relate to other people. Exactly. I agree with him wholeheartedly. So I'm sure we can take that into all fields. My next question, Barbara, happens to be, I suppose, the egg and chicken question of which came first, and this deals with the effect of television upon sports. I may be in error because my research is most limited, mostly empirical. And that is, it seems to me, however, that uh, the great love that has been created recently in this country for soccer came from the grassroots. It came from the young people, and, and uh, they got an interest in it through a very dynamic personality, of course, in soccer. And we started filling stadiums with 70,000 people, and then when that happened, television seemed to follow behind and, and cover that. Yet in tennis, it appears that, although there was some growing interest in that, uh, and uh, the same thing was true of golf many years ago, that television seemed to be in the forefront and pushed it and then people followed it if they watched it on TV. Is this observation uh, have any merit? Uh, what I'm trying to say, which comes first when a sport takes the country, television produced it, or uh, did the sport uh, create an interest in television Well, I, I think it works both ways. If you recall about, uh, oh dear, I would say five to six years ago, CBS did soccer on weekends and it was an absolute disaster. No one watched. Uh, soccer in this country was uh, an unknown sport. The kids didn't play it in elementary school, junior high school, high school, unless they were in a prep school or unless they were basically in an Ivy League college. They really didn't know soccer. So CBS's attempt to televise soccer on weekends was a terrible disaster. They folded uh, after their first season and we didn't hear anything else about soccer until we began to get people like Pelé who came into New York and of course New York is an interesting place. That's a melting pot. You've got a lot of people who are European in, in personality. As a matter of fact, I feel that New York is more European in character than it is, for instance, Californian. I think that New Yorkers are much closer to the European train of thought. That's reflected in all areas of the media. The New York Times has a lot more international news than you'll find, for instance, in the Los Angeles Times. So consequently, there are a lot of people who did grow up with soccer or whose families grew up with soccer, and they began to go out to see what they found was good soccer. Now, the North American Soccer League, since its inception, has progressed every year to be a better and better uh, vehicle for the sport. This year, uh, as you say, we're filling stadiums with 70, 75,000 people coming out. You, you, you'll do that. You'll go out to see a Pele. You'll go out to see a Georgie Best, to, to see a Beckenbauer. Some of the people who are involved in soccer have made it exciting. Also, the North American Soccer League has promoted better than any sport I know. Uh, the Dallas Tornado has been one of the most innovative groups in the country. And one of the things I find fascinating is that all the kids in the Dallas public school system are playing soccer now. Uh, a few years ago, Little League Baseball was the great thing to, to play, you know, as a kid. Now, in the Dallas area, there are more kids playing youth soccer than there are playing Little League. Now, fortunately, I'm delighted because I've always felt that Little League was a game to keep the parents off the streets. And it seemed to me that, you know, if, if your kid had Adidas shoes, the kid next door has to have Pumas. If your kid has a $30 glove, the kid next door has a $35 glove. And the parents are so involved, and I've seen too many 10-year-olds crying because of the harassment and the criticism that they receive on the baseball field. And uh, the thing about youth soccer is that, for starters, every child has to play at least half the game who's on the team which means that there's nobody who has to sit on the bench and bear the, the, the punishment and the embarrassment of not being able to play. Also, you don't need anything to play. You need a pair of shoes, tennis shoes, and you need a pair of shorts, and that's it. And because parents don't know the game, they're not out there second-guessing all the officials and the coaches. They say, okay, let my kid go out and play whatever this game is. I don't know anything about it, but let him go out and play it because he has a good time. So soccer is really catching on, as you say, among the grassroots areas in the country. We noticed this in, um, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, any place where they've seen North American soccer now, the kids are really beginning to push it in the lower school programs. Now, on the other hand, you mentioned tennis. Um, it's really difficult and fascinating to examine the tennis boom in this country, and I do think that television has played a large part. As a matter of fact, I, I would hazard to say that the greatest impetus to that sport 
ever was the Billie Jean King Bobby Riggs match uh, that ABC had back in 1971 or two in the Astrodome. That probably had more impact on the sport in this country than any other single event. And of course now we've played it to death because we have so over-covered tennis in the last two years that now our network and the other two I understand as well will have almost no tennis next year. We've cut back from what was tennis every weekend to two events next year. We're going to cover Wimbledon and we're going to do the Family Circle Cup and that's it. We won't be doing any other matches. And that's devastating to someone like me because I really love tennis. That's probably my number one love in sport. And uh, we simply milked it for all it was worth plus. And now the fans are saying, hey, I can see tennis all the time. Why should I bother? So now we're going to have less and less. So then I hope it pushes it back the other way. <laughs> Thank you. Janelle Burke. Uh, related to Tony's question, how much do you think the media affects attitudes? Does the media make a star? Uh, the Dorothy Hamels, the Olga Cor oh, Corbis. How do, you, how do you decide who you're going to cover? Oh, that's really tough. The person just has a special sparkle there, and, and they're easy to cover, and they're, they're that, alive. That really in front is of tough. It's, um, in the case of, uh, well, let's use tennis as an example. If I'm going to do a story on tennis, uh, I want to do a story on somebody that I think the audience is going to relate to, particularly if I'm doing it, for instance, for the Today program because that, that I know what kind of audience we have on today. I know what kind of audience we had on Grandstand and what kind of audience we have on our uh, halftime programs. So we sort of gear our, our person to the audience. But then you have to realize there are certain people who are very gregarious, who are very uh, attractive, and they can either sell something or they can more or less unsell it. And yes, I think we are responsible to a large extent because we do latch on to people who have charisma. Uh, Billie Jean was a good example. You know, we've used Billie Jean to death. We've used Chris Everett, although she has nowhere near the charisma that Billie Jean has. Um, it, it's difficult to say. When you, when you talk about the Olympic stars, people like Olga Corbett, people like uh, Nadja Comaneci, they have, they have become such superstars through the medium of television that now every city you go to, all the little girls are out studying gymnastics. And 15 years ago, nobody studied gymnastics in this country. The same thing happened after Mark Spitz was uh, so successful in the Olympics in Munich. You go out and everybody's in swimming programs. So I think that it's having a major effect. It's difficult to say whether we look for the star or whether the star is just so overwhelming that we can't avoid covering that person. I don't know whether we make them or whether they make the program. It's hard to say. I'll have to sort of beg out of that one. <laughs> Last thing up here. I'd like to stay on that just a minute, if I may, <clears throat> in an area that's related. Uh, the number of sports personalities that have uh, picked up the sh sort of showbiz, grandstanding type of uh, thing because of their exposure in sports and have carried on to uh, the area of entertainment, more mm -hmm. or less, in, in sports. And also how that sifts back into the sports area itself and it's beginning to be more of an entertainment than it is a sport. Well, and how do you feel that this uh, affects the kids that are, that are watching uh, this kind of thing and seeing their models basically as entertainers, uh, showbiz type people? Well, I think you're right in the, that it is happening more and more. Another thing that, that bothers me a, a great deal is that sports is becoming big showbiz. You know, it's, it's sad to know that you have a major event on the air, say on a Sunday afternoon. Maybe you've got uh, an AAU track meet or perhaps you have uh, a, a basketball game or whatever, and you know that on another channel they've got um, sports challenge of the sexes or the superstars and that they're going to eat you alive in the ratings and, and you see this is what's happening uh, we're finding more and more that people will watch programs where they see super athletes go out and either make fools of themselves or, or show their lack of competence in other areas and we are making the athletes into entertainers then on the other side of the coin the legitimate sports vehicles are losing ground in the television industry because they can't compete with the big names that are going on another station so i think it's a i think it's a major problem that that television is going to have to decide we're going to cover sports as a serious subject or we're going to more or less make uh, make jest of it and uh, enjoy the athletes as entertainers now how that affects the children i think we won't know for for years yet to come. I do see how it's uh, affecting some of the younger athletes who are coming up. Uh, 
for instance, this year when Tony Dorsett signed with the Dallas Cowboys, I went out to, to Thousand Oaks, California to do a, an interview with Tony. And I mean, man, this is Mr. Charisma. He says, they call me TD, and that's what I like to be called. I mean, you know, he's got everything going for him, and he realizes that uh, with, a, with patterns like O.J. Simpson and Don Meredith and Frank Gifford and Merlin Olson, that the thing to do is really come on with the pizzazz, the charisma, so that he can be a Joe Namath overnight. And then after he's played football for a few years, he can be making commercials, he can be doing endorsements, and go on to all the other things. So I would say that the kids are probably emulating these athletes that they see going to other areas, not only because they've been good athletes, and in some cases they're sort of so-so athletes, but also because they find that there are so many other ways to make money and to satisfy your ego after you finish doing whatever it is that you do as an athlete. So I, I think they probably are emulating them to some extent. Jim Upchurch. Uh, and talking along the same line, you mentioned the, the aspect of, of TV coverage of particular sports. And uh, of course, being an old wrestling coach, uh, I was just wondering if you could relate uh, to us maybe the possibility of uh, whether there will be more coverage of, say, intercollegiate uh, wrestling. I'm inclined to say absolutely not. <laughs> not intercollegiate anything. Uh, it's, it's absolutely devastating to see what happens. But uh, we find that, certainly on a national level, that unless someone truly relates to a team, that they simply don't watch. And unfortunately, in network television, as opposed to local television, if they don't watch, that's a death knell. I mean, you're not going to you're not going to get it on if people aren't going to watch because you lose the ratings, you lose the sponsors, and every minute on network television costs so much money to produce that we simply find that we can't make the money back. And as you no doubt have learned by now, the networks don't do too much just for the uh, the goodwill of the community. <laughs> I mean, we find that this is even true in in college. Um, basketball, ABC finds that it's true in college football. If you've got Notre Dame on, you're going to have a good audience. If you've got uh, Southern Cal on, you're going to have a good audience. If you've got Texas and Arkansas, you're going to have a good audience. But when you have on uh, Baylor and Rice, you don't have a very big audience. So the advertising dollar doesn't come into the same extent the next year because your ratings were poor. We found that uh, college basketball, which NBC has been doing for several years now, is having a great struggle because we're up against the NBA on uh, the, the weekends. And that's very difficult because if, if we have uh, Providence or if we have I Indiana or even, even the good teams, we can't compete with the Celtics and the Knicks and the Lakers. So it's, um, it's becoming a major problem even in the major sports. I'm, I'm inclined to think we'll see less and less in our collegiate sport. Barbara, that, I think that brings us in another question, that's one that fascinates me. I as thought a, it might. As a political <laughs> scientist, uh, yes, you know, political yes. science, I'm very interested in the question of freedom of press and, and speech and so forth. And we hear small groups in particular all the time dealing with censorship in relation to television, and anyone involved in television must experience this from time to time. And quite often groups that are, I'm sure, sincere in their own way indicate there's too much sports on television, or if it's not mm -hmm. that, there's something else that they don't like on television, or certain uh, television programs do not have good taste in them in relation to what's discussed and so forth. And they attempt through petitions and other means to censor that. They're always answered with um, two or three points, one being a constitutional one, that's freedom of press and speech, and the court at times backs that. But also they're told by the television media, and I want to get your response as a person so involved, that they shouldn't be uh, using that method to the extent they do, that, that the general population in a free society will a censor by ratings dropping. You've mentioned that several times a day. Is this your answer? Do you believe that, uh, for example, if a certain program is unpopular to a certain group but the ratings are very, very high, should that program stay on the air because people are watching? That program will stay on the air because people are watching and I think it's unfortunate. I think that we make our first mistake in assuming that our audiences will be discriminating audiences because they simply aren't. Uh, in, in too many instances, the television is either a babysitter or it's a pablum manufacturer for the kids, for the, the adults who have nothing else to do, and they'll simply watch whatever's on and they'll pick the best of the three things that happen to be on in that time slot. We've seen, uh, we've seen that manifest itself in the, the idea that you can change the time slot of a program, put it on opposite a weaker program, and suddenly it's dynamite. Everybody in the country loves it. My own feeling is that, yes, we have too much garbage on the air, not just in sports, but in, in traditional programming. However, I have not seen any major effort that's been terribly successful. Now, 60 Minutes is, uh, is certainly one of the, the, the greatest programs on, on television, in my opinion, and it, it's a program that has been successful despite 
the fact that it's been up against very good programming on, on other networks, and despite the fact that we don't think people want to be educated. However, I think 60 Minutes is one that, that's the proof of the pudding. If a program is done well, and if it's interesting and entertaining as well, then, then someone will watch it. I don't know what the solution is. As, as you well know, a few years ago, the uh, FCC gave uh, what, what's called primetime access time to the local stations. They thought that that would give each local station an opportunity to produce something of worth in the community. We didn't find that to be true. We found that the local stations went out and bought reruns of I Love Lucy, and they put the gong show on it at 7.30 or whatever in an effort to, again, keep ratings and spend as little money as possible. Because as you no doubt know here, we've got a lot of people in the studio right now. It's expensive to produce a television program. So we find that fewer and fewer local stations are interested in producing something for public consumption. And I don't know what the solution is. Uh, in educational television, certainly we're making some inroads. The um, public broadcasting company has, has done some things, yet I see them pushing also toward the entertainment side as opposed to the, the more serious and uh, perhaps educational side. So I don't know where it's going to end. I wish I could believe that suddenly the mass audience is going to wake up and say, hold it right here. I don't want any part of this. I'm not buying that product because I don't like what they sponsor. That's the ultimate answer. If we say, that deodorant sponsors that program, which is rotten, so I'm not going to buy the sponsor's product, then if we could see that correlation, I would think maybe it would work. Otherwise, I don't see that there's any, that there's any great hope for us in the next few years. Janelle Berg. Following that particular line of questioning, you were a children's, uh, responsible for children's programming. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at what kinds of programs you were going to have on the air for children to view? Well, I will tell you my experience in children's programming. Uh, one year, when I uh, moved to Colorado, I was new in the area, didn't have a job, and the only job available was to do romper room. And uh, that's really sort of a fascinating program. It's, it's very educationally oriented. It's uh, along the old line of education where you don't uh, memorize. It's not rote learning. And um, at the time, I was very opposed to, to Sesame Street, which was a relatively new program at that time, because I felt that they taught children in, in, in the wrong manner, not, not a manner that I was willing to accept, because I was very conservative <laughs> in my attitude toward educating children. And uh, the parents of, of one of my children on, on Romper Room came in and said, my little two-and-a-half-year-old son can, can say his ABCs because he's been listening on Romper Room. I said, yeah, he could sing a beer commercial, too, if he heard it enough times. But that doesn't mean that he can relate A to Z or 1 to 8 or whatever. But uh, anyway, uh, as, as a Romper Room teacher, uh, we received specific instructions as to what we were to teach every day of every week of the year. So uh, I didn't really have any uh, input to that program. After that, uh, at another station, when I was program director, I also originated uh, a children's program called Serendipity, which was uh, all shot on location. And we went to areas that were uh, of particular interest to, to children. We went to zoos, to libraries, to uh, children's functions and whatever, and shot everything on location. It was a terribly expensive undertaking. It's very difficult to shoot location filming. And then to go into the, uh, to the studios and editing rooms and put the piece together and get it on the air. And it was an hour program, which turned out to be a tremendous expense. It was worthwhile in that uh, I felt that we made some, some interesting strides toward making an entertaining program out of something that was basically educational. And we, we had a lot of children on the program, so it worked well, but I really don't have enough experience to offer any expertise in the field. What kinds of things do you think children should be watching? Do you think they should be watching programs geared directly to the children, or do you think they should be also watching situational comedies, for example? Uh, well, I think it depends on the age of the child and how much they are able to comprehend. For instance, uh, when All in the Family first came on the air, my daughter came home from school all the time saying, everybody else can watch All in the Family. Well, I felt that she was um, too susceptible to the attitudes and opinions that she would see on television. Because unfortunately, when we see something on television or read something in the newspaper, we accept it as fact. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I didn't think that she was old enough to understand satire <coughs> adequately. So I had to say, I'm sorry, but you can't watch this program. And I tried my best to explain to her so that she could understand that, that there were viewpoints expressed that were in fun, but that it was difficult to understand 
which viewpoints were in fun and which were, were serious. So uh, consequently, uh, I, I didn't always have a happy child on whatever night all in the family was on. I think that um, there are some programs that are, that are very interesting for children. Um, for instance, uh, one program that Leonard Nimoy has on now, In Search Of, which is an absolute fascinating program. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's one of the few things that I, that I watch regularly on television. And uh, it, it's always on interesting phenomena, scientific phenomena, locational phenomena, historical things. Now, to say, okay, you've got to watch that is one thing. I think some of the things that are on educational television, for whatever age, are great for children. A uh, series that used to be on NBC, the Hallmark Hall of Fame, was absolutely fantastic. I grew up watching watching that, loved it. I think the, the game shows, the quiz shows are fun for kids because it's difficult to hurt them with that. And I think a lot of the situation comedies are certainly uh, reasonable uh, viewing fair for older children, uh, particularly things like One Day at a Time, which uh, I think every single parent can probably identify with. I know I certainly do. I am Bonnie Franklin. <laughs> There's no question about it. I have my own teenage daughter at home. And when um, when that program's on, we always sit and watch it. You know, we really can relate to the people who are involved. And you can look at them and say, hey, I'm not the only person who has that problem. And the kids can say, I am not the only, the, the only child who has a, a parent who's in this situation. So I do think they can relate. The younger children, I think um, some of the programs that are designed for young children are absolutely incredible. I mean, some of the violence that we see in programs specifically designed for children, which we used to have in comic books and at the movies. I guess we didn't die from it, so our kids are not going to die from it. However, I, I'm not necessarily encouraged by what I see. During the commercials on your, uh, on your um, programs, mm -hmm. do you have the violent scenes? And aren't children then able to see the violent scenes? During the commercials, it seems to me mm. that the commercial comes on, you know, and this is advertisement to everyone should watch. Well, that, you know, that's true, and, and that's like going to the movies. One of my biggest complaints about going to movies is that you go to a movie that's rated GP, and prior to the movie in the preview, they show the very worst scenes <laughs> from a movie that's rated R or should be rated X, because obviously they want everybody to come back, but I mean, the kids have seen more in the preview than you ever wanted them to see in anything. <laughs> so yes, I think you have a valid point there, and I think certainly uh, the networks uh, are behooved to come up with some other answer to promotions and to, uh, and to commercials. It, it, you, it's a good point, and I hadn't really thought too much about it in television, but you're absolutely right. Bob While we're on that point of, of violence, and uh, TV sometimes seems to be the whipping boy for many things, and today it seems to be the violence that's mm -hmm. occurring with the advent of the trial going on in Miami. And I would like to relate this to uh, sports. Do you feel that TV has, uh, because of its sophisticated means of keying in on things that the average fan in the, in the audience can't see, that it's really um, captivated and used violence that may occur normally in a, in a particular contact sport and has exploited this aspect. Yes, I think, I think it has. Um, and in some ways, it, it's worked well. It's, it's difficult for me ever to understand the sociological impact of sport because the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. And if indeed people go to football games because they can vicariously experience their own hostility, then I suppose we're performing a great function by allowing someone to participate vicariously in, the, in this hostility on the football field. And if we like to believe that that keeps them from beating up their wife, I mean, that's fine. However, I did see um, one, uh, one test study that the results of which were, were published last week, and I believe they said that, uh, that more men uh, are apt to beat up their wives after watching television and seeing a football game than when they don't watch television. And I was inclined to wonder whether women also beat up their husbands after football games. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yes, I think, I think we do see more. If you recall, in the past few years, when a player is injured on the field, the first thing they do is take away to some other shot. Now, why do we cut away from an injured player? That doesn't make any sense to me. We don't cut away from whatever it was that, that injured him. We show that and replay it five times so they can see the violence in the hit or whatever it is, yet we don't know what's happened to this poor body that's lying prone on the field. So I think we do see more of, of the violence. Whether that's what um, we want to see, I don't know. But again, in sports like everything else, the sensationalistic aspect is what's going to get the attention because that's what people want to see. I think an excellent example of that, and I don't want to mention 
professional wrestling in the same manner in which Jim talked about uh, athletic uh, events in colleges and high schools because obviously it's two completely different sports. But if there's, a, if there's anything on television on a local level that's been as popular as wrestling was during the 50s and the early parts of the 60s, I don't know what it is. I mean, you see grandmothers sitting in front of their television sets saying, you know, hit him over the head with a chair, bloody his face, <laughs> and, and they don't know that he's not really hurting him or that it's not real blood. I mean, they take it very seriously, and that's what they wanted to see. So I don't know whether we're making any inroads or whether we're going backwards, but I think we're showing people what they want to see. Whether that's good or not, I don't know. Do you think, though, that uh, this may be debatable, that uh, and this has been argued in some of our discussions this week, uh, that the sport itself is becoming more violent? And then uh, top that off, we're showing more of it. Uh. You're talking about football? Football, primarily. Whether it's becoming more violent, I rather doubt that because uh, the equipment is so much more sophisticated now that what appears to be a, a good deal of violence is basically absorbed by a lot of the shock absorption in, in the equipment. So I really don't know whether people are more violent or whether they're getting hurt any more than they were, say, 10 years ago when the equipment wasn't quite as sophisticated. I do know that the, the players are larger. The athletes not only are, are larger today, they're faster, and they have more capacity, I think, for, for violence than they have. And also, I, I think they, again, do exactly what's going to be necessary to keep their jobs because 20 years ago it was not a big deal to be a professional football player. Now it's a very big deal. You not only can have a great career uh, in football and make an awful lot of money, but as we have seen you can go into other areas. Even if you become a stockbroker after 10 years in the National Football League, you're going to be the most successful stockbroker in Houston or Miami or wherever you are because of your name. So I think that perhaps the, the players are more enthusiastic, they're more zealous, more willing to go out and bang heads on Sunday afternoon because they realize that uh, this, this may be ultimately responsible for their livelihood for the rest of their lives. So yes, maybe they are more violent in that respect. I, I wonder too, and since the, the, the idea of uh, personality is becoming important, and uh, I'm thinking back to Dick Butkus and his description of head drilling mm -hmm. and these types of things, and when this happens, so we key in on those players that, that seem to uh, adhere to this kind of thing mm -hmm. and we make big names of them. That's right. I think Conrad Dobler is a great right. example of that. I know last year uh, on our grandstand program I went to do a, a rather in-depth interview with, with Conrad and with people who played against him, people who played with him. I mean this is a very violent individual. <laughs> he's somebody I wouldn't want to come across in the street much less on the football field. I mean he's, he's a pretty tough guy. And it is true. I mean, that's why we went out to talk to him, because that was his reputation, that he was the meanest man in the National Football League. So we went to talk to him. Are you really the meanest man? What's so mean about you? I mean, you know, this, the whole thing uh, was a little out of context because he had made a big name for himself simply because he was ugly. And everybody knows who Conrad Dobler is, almost everybody. I must tell you that after we had finished the interview, I was staying at a hotel, which was on his way home. And he said, fine, I'll drop you off at the hotel. So uh, we were going to the hotel, and he accidentally went in the exit. And he's got this little sports car, you know, and it, it looks rather, uh, uh, <laughs> well, it wouldn't attract a lot of attention if we hadn't been going in the exit. Well, the doorman comes out from the hotel, and he's going like this, you know, wait, wait, get out of here. The doorman's really ready to be ugly. You know, he's going to come out and really tell this guy what's what. And so uh, I said, here, I'll, I'll hop out and run in. Just, you know, just turn around and go back. And so about this time, Conrad opens the door and unfolds himself, and he's a huge man. And he's standing beside this little tiny sports car, and then the doorman comes up and he says, Oh, he said, uh, uh, hey, hey, you were going the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, Conrad said, Yeah, Mace, I'm just going to drop this lady, and I'm going right back out. And the guy said, I know who you are. And he said, Yeah. And he said, You're that pitcher with the Cardinals, Al Roboski, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he got very small in a hurry. Uh, Conrad and Al Roboski do look a little alike. You know, they've got the same mustache, the same general features. And it, he first he said, you know, you're with the Cardinals, aren't you? And he said, yeah, you're that relief pitcher, Al Roboski. So, uh, you know, he was an awful mean man until somebody sort of brought him back down to his own size. Where, where do we really draw the line between <clears throat> that kind of violence that may be a show mm -hmm. And possibly I don't think it's a show. <laughs> I'm sure it's me. real to the other fellow. But uh, the situation which we have, for instance, with uh, George Atkinson. Well, it's, it's difficult. I've known George for several years, and uh, George is a tough guy to play against. Now, you see, it does two things for the athlete. 
one thing is that if you're going up against George Atkinson, you're automatically intimidated. And I think that's certainly to George's advantage. Now, George really has to be caught. You really have to say, okay, here's the evidence, and you have to be able to prove it, which as we've seen, no one's been able to do so far. Um, if George does all the things that he's accused of doing, he's accused of being very violent, biting, kicking, pinching, all, all these ugly things. If he is indeed doing that, I think it's greatly to his advantage. He's made a name for himself, and all the other players who come up against him are very reluctant to be in his part of the field on Sunday afternoon. I don't know what we can do about it. I wish I did. I mean, obviously, the NFL has been unable to, to take any major uh, step toward curbing that, but I, I don't think that... If it's, uh, if, it's, if it's being tough just to be tough, uh, I, I don't think that he can get away with it for a long period of time because now everybody's going to be looking at him. The eye of the television camera is always going to be on George Atkinson. So now the things that he's been able to get away with in the past, if indeed he did, we're going to be able to catch him at, and then we'll have the evidence. So maybe he'll be uh, a little more malleable this year. Jim up, Jared. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what has been the reaction of some of these uh, individual athletes uh, to a woman sportscaster. Oh, it's been uh, great. The, the, the guys have just been super, and one would not necessarily think that would be the case. But I suppose it, it depends on a woman's approach. My feeling has always been that uh, athletes like the President of the United States or anybody else have a right to privacy. I've never tried to, to go into an athlete's locker room or dressing room, not a male athlete or a female athlete. I feel that uh, no more would I follow the President into his shower and say, Mr. President, I didn't understand the remark you made in your news conference. I mean, why should I try to follow an athlete into his, what should be his own private area? And uh, because I have never pushed to, uh, to, to do things which I, I felt were out of line for me, They've always made every effort to, to make things easier for me. For instance, after a football game, if I want to talk to a player, they'll bring the player to talk to me first. They'll give me a quiet room so that I can sit down by myself and interview the player before he goes in to face the hassle with everybody else. And I have every advantage going for me because if I'm in a locker room, I've got 20,000 people there trying to get questions in with everyone I ask. If I have him by myself, I can sit down, we can be comfortable, we can carry on a one-to-one -one conversation. And I've found it to be a tremendous advantage. The athletes uh, generally look forward to their friends in the business who do their homework, whether they're male or female. And I've just never had anybody be anything less than gracious. Barbara, another question that we get in our part of the country in our conversations at social gatherings and so forth is the amazement that some people have for the salaries that certain pers <laughs> TV personalities get. Johnny Carson, I believe, is around $3 million, and we've heard that, or mm -hmm. Barbara Walters, $1 million, uh, for a year's work. Uh, what's your reaction to these kind of salaries, citizens? Uh... I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, it, it's really hard to say. You know, we, we talk about salary, and we never quite see it in the, in the proper context, because when I was growing up, if anyone had ever told me that I would make the money that I make now, I mean, I would have laughed. I wouldn't expect to make as much in my lifetime as I make in a year. Um, I think we have to understand, let, let's use Johnny Carson as an example, whatever they pay Johnny he's worth. Because The Tonight Show has been incredible drawing for NBC for the last 14 years now. Well, it's past that of course, but Johnny's been with the program now for 14 years. There's no way they can put a price tag on Johnny Carson because when you look at the, the the kind of ratings that The Tonight Show brings in, the money that the sponsors pour into that program and the personality that they've developed in Johnny, two things happen. First, you're paying him for what he does for your network, and then you're paying him not to go to another network. And uh, You've obviously seen that work in, in the case of Barbara Walters. Uh, we just recently had it happen with us with Don Meredith. As you know, Don used to be with ABC, and then he came to NBC, and now we've lost him again to ABC. And two things have happened to us. First of all, we've lost the person that I thought was the greatest sports announcer in, in the business and not only do we lose him but somebody else gets him which makes it doubly devastating so it's very difficult to put a price tag on on talent yet you have to say well they're worth whatever the the, the, the situation will allow and frankly I don't know how much farther it's going to allow us but um, I think most of us just sort of feel like right now the the best thing to do is just um, roll with the punches because the money's probably not always going to be there and just try to save as much money as you can because you know you never know in this business when you're going to be unemployed. You talk about somebody who maybe makes uh, 
half a million dollars or a million dollars a year. Well, you have to understand that our contracts are generally for anywhere between 13 weeks and three years. And uh, many people have 13-week uh, contracts where the, the network has the option of dropping them every 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. now, that's devastating to live with that. You never know uh, every 13-week period or every year period or however long your contract uh, term is whether you're going to be employed the next 13 weeks or the next year or the next three years. So I, I think probably we pay the penalties as, as well as make the money because this year it's here, next year you may have nothing. It must also be obvious that since it is a profit-making business that they're not going to pay someone if they're not making money. That's right. That's right. It's in direct relationship. Yes. <laughs> How do you juggle the many responsibilities that you have? You're a successful career woman. You have a, a, a daughter at home. Uh, how do you juggle these things? You travel? Well, it's it's getting easier. My daughter's almost 15 now, and uh, it's easier because she's old enough to very adequately care for herself. And uh, she's a very mature young lady and also quite bright. She really has her head together. So that's one problem I don't have to be concerned with. If I'm, if I'm away for extended periods of time, it is a problem. Then generally I bring my mother in from Texas, and she stays with her, and I go wandering around wherever. Um, so my daughter is, is a minimal problem, if I could say that she was a problem at all, because fortunately she's what keeps me sane, <laughs> and uh, she's the greatest thing that I have going for me, so I, I never consider her as a problem. Uh, the traveling is something I really love. I'm an absolute gypsy. And if I thought I had to stay in one place for the rest of my life, I'd just say, that's it. This is the rest of my life. I pass. Because I really love to travel. I, I'm perfectly happy living out of a suitcase, living in hotels, and wandering around. I mean, that, I, I could do it forever. And I've never lived any place longer than three years since I was out of high school. That, that was my, my longest period of time was three years stint in Colorado. So uh, I, that doesn't bother me. The, the only thing that really does get to me sometime is that if I have several projects going at once, it's trying to juggle the time. Getting to Idaho, you know, you can't get here from New York. You have to go to Tokyo and turn north. I, I've never experienced anything quite like this. So today I had to figure out how I could get in early this morning, make commercials in New York, get the only flight that had a connection available to get to, to Idaho on time to speak tonight. And those are the little things that, that, that really get to be a problem to try to figure out how to juggle the, your, your time schedule. But usually, uh, it, it's not that big a problem. NBC is going to the Olympics, are you? Yes, I expect I will. I was just in uh, the Soviet Union last week, and it was my first visit there. So it was an absolutely overwhelming experience for me, and something that I'll never forget. I went there with uh, World Team Tennis. They uh, play a match between American players and Soviet players. And it was just an incredible experience for me. And I certainly hope that in 1980, I'll be going back uh, for a longer period of time. Barbara, as you have done hundreds of times I've gotten the cue that we're out of time. Uh, on behalf of the panel and our staff, I want to express a very great appreciation to you for being on our program today. It's been one of the more enjoyable programs, and I know our audience has been enjoying it, too. Does he say that after everyone? No, I do not. <laughs> I have the witnesses of my viewers. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this evening has been Barbara Hunter, a sportscaster for NBC News. I know that you have enjoyed uh, all of our six programs dealing with the future sports, and we intend in the future to bring you other programs on very pertinent topics for a series of weeks. May I, at this time, invite you to be with us again the next Saturday on this station at this same time when again we'll be discussing what we hope is a significant issue of our country and our times. And until that time, this is your moderator, Tony Stewart, wishing you a good evening. <laughs> North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. <laughs>